Hello, good morning and welcome to 20 Minute Cities Norwich version. It's a lovely sunny day outside the cathedral here. Um, it's also very chilly, so excuse all the clothes I'm wearing. My name's Andy Bennett. I'm a performance poet and writer who lives in Norwich. And with me holding the camera is Mr. Tom Clutterbuck, who's going to turn the camera around. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah. So thank you to him for doing this, because it'd be really difficult doing it on my own. Um, we're going to take a walk around the city, look at some lovely picturesque places and talk about uh, the history of Norwich as, uh, as a city of literature and some of the reasons why Norwich is still a city of literature today. Um, so let's get going. Um, I'm going to start by, um, as you've seen, this wonderful cathedral behind me. Uh, it's obviously one of the oldest buildings in Norwich. May as well start walking. Um, but uh, it was built by a guy, a Norman, who came over with uh, the Normans in the Norman Conquest. It was built by a guy called Herbert de la Singa. And he's actually one of the first um, kind of literature figures that we have records for in this country, in this city. Um, so because he was a, a very voracious consumer of books. He got many, many sermons of his, a great writer, uh, many letters of his. And often in his letters, he, uh, he's always asking for more and more books. And because he was a very powerful man, people used to send them to him. Um, so actually, his, uh, his collection of books here is one of the first kind of unofficial libraries, I suppose you could say, we had in this country, in this city. I keep saying this country, sorry. Um, uh, so he's a very uh, influential figure, and of course, this is a very dominating uh, place. Often we get sort of, sort of theatre things happening in the cathedral close and things like that. Um, so it's a wonderful, wonderful place to start our little tour. We're going to be crossing one of the two busy roads we have to cross today. So uh, if the, the traffic noise gets louder, I'll just have to stand closer to the, the road. Um, I'm going to be talking about, obviously, the history and writers who come tonight, but as I said, there's also a lot going on, and just because um, Matt, who did the, uh, the Melbourne 20-minute cities run, was pointing out nice little bits of graffiti, I thought I'd show you these. Look at this classic red post box, classic English red post box. So if you come a little closer, Tom, you can see here, it says, you still have one unread message. Possibly because about two years ago, they went around writing, you have unread mail, or you have mail. Council washed them all off again. So now you still have one unread message. If that's not literature, I don't know what is. Let's go, go back to crossing the road. I'm going to go press the button so we don't get killed while we cross the road. Um, so, yeah. Safety first, ladies and gentlemen. There's two possible ways we can go from here. We can go right or we can go left. Left, we come to a, a church called St. George's, uh, where the writer Robert Green was baptised. Um, and now we're going to cross the road. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely cab there. <laughs> British cab. And surprisingly cheery British cab driver as well. Um, so, yeah, behind me is the St. George's, where Robert Green was buried. He's a, a, a fascinating character. Um, if you ever want to um, look him up or anything like that, he's a, a contemporary of Shakespeare, and it's one of the, first, in fact, the first mention we have or reference we have to Shakespeare is in one of Green's writings at the end of his life. I like the fact that that book's called Green's Groat's Worth of Wit. Green's Groat's Worth of Wit, yeah, absolutely. And uh, he was pretty full of himself as well. Um, but amazingly prolific. Um, he, you know, would average about five publications a year for, uh, at his height, um, which for that time is unbelievable. And it's it's interesting because, uh, you know, he always uh, prided himself on being a writer from Norwich. And also, um, he, uh, he was probably the first person in this country to make a living just by his writing. Obviously, they've been scribes and people like that. Um, but he was the first person probably to entirely make his living uh, through just his pen, I suppose. And he's a fascinating character to look him up. What we're standing outside here is a wonderful, wonky um, old building, medieval building. Augustine Seward House, or sometimes Augustine Stewart House. Uh, the only reason I point out, apart from the fact that it's absolutely beautiful, um, is that it was the night where a gentleman called Lord Sheffield uh, spent the, his last night on this planet because he was leading the Royal Army against uh, what was called Kett's Rebellion in 1549. And he was killed in a battle just down there, around the corner. I say battle, it was more of a street fight. And he got his head hacked off with a meat cleaver by a butcher. Um, but I mentioned Catch Rebellion, A, because I'm a massive history geek, and I used to be a tour guide around here. Um, so if I slip into just historical anecdotes, I do apologize. 
Um, but also, uh, Kensal Belly, and it's, it's probably the most famous, but there's a long tradition of uh, dissent, non-conformism, uh, and just a general unorthodox view of uh, uh, in Norwich. It's got a big history of that as well, and we'll be talking about that more as we go along. I've just passed a lovely pub called Take Five, and we're coming towards another lovely pub uh, called Olives, both of which uh, have regular um, sort of live literature, poetry reading nights, um, which I've performed. Uh, and uh, it's, these are, I mean, they're small little places, but these are the kind of places, and there's loads of doing nights, if you know where to look for them, um, going around. There's really nice, uh, from, you know, uh, from whatever your level of professionalism, you can find somewhere to read your work in this city, uh, which certainly helped me uh, in my career. Uh, and many, many other people. Um, and even if you don't even want a career, um, you've still got an outlet where you can go um, to, you know, just perform and read your works to, um, you know, sympathetic audiences. Very lovely audiences as well. Um, now, we're coming to a street called Elm Hill here, um, which you may have noticed. I'm on a walking stick at the moment, and this is Hobbit, so this is going to be fun. Um, but we're going past. Uh, this is a really beautiful street. They say it has like the largest collection of Tudor houses outside London, neglecting the fact that London had a big fire and stuff. But um, this is a really beautiful um, place to come. You'll also notice, as we go around, lots and lots of churches in Norwich, and we'll talk about those as well as we go along. Um, we're coming up to a place called uh, the Paston House uh, on Elm Hill which is, um, a, well, you'll see, it's a very old, lovely um, medieval building. Um, and it was the home in the 15th century of um, uh, a married couple, one of their homes, uh, called John and Mary Paston. And they're uh, important uh, in, in historical terms and literary terms because we have what's called the Paston Letters, which is a, a huge collection spanning 80 years of uh, English history, where... Um, they would just, like John would be in London, Margaret would be in Norwich, and they would send a letter saying, oh, what's happened around the house? Um, which is, if you know English history, the period covering the Wars of the Roses um, and things like that. And uh, it's a great resource for the, the historian um, to talk about daily life and what was going on in, uh, in Norwich during that period of turmoil. But also, you know, just seeing those letters and, and seeing how the gentry wrote in uh, in the 15th century and later. And as I say, it stretches 80 years and it's very important. And if Tom maybe takes a step back or not, whatever, you can see how beautiful it is as well. Which will give me a chance to get my breath back and think about a little bit more about what I'm going to say next. Um, coming up, I said this is called Elm Hill. And you'll see there's a lovely, I don't even know if that's an elm tree there, a lovely big old tree there. Um, one of the things I've always loved about Norwich is the fact that um, it's very difficult to tell whether it's a, an orchard in a city or a city in an orchard, um, because we do have lots of trees. Um, and you'll notice those as we go around. When you're, you know, if you're struggling with inspiration and the blank white page, sometimes you don't have to go off into the countryside as a romantic poet like I am. Um, you can just walk into the city and still be surrounded by nature and the trees, and that's something I've always loved about Norwich. Uh, coming up this hill, as I get a bit, little bit more out from there, <laughs> and realise I smoke too much, um, we're coming to Prince's Street, which is the site, and I can't really do a literary tour of Norwich without, uh, without mentioning it. Uh, we, we won't go past it, but we can point to it. Um, the, the offices of the Writers' Centre Norwich, um, who... Well, A, are paying for the data that you're probably uh, watching right now, uh, which is very kind of them. But um, they've been a really big part, uh, A, of getting Norwich uh, nominated and, and uh, awarded the City of Literature status. Um, but uh, more than that, it's just the everyday uh, running day-to-day -day of the literature life of the city that they're kind of taking the lead on um, from by all ends of the spectrum, getting internationally renowned and famous writers to come here and uh, perform or read from their works and just do talks about their craft and so on and so forth. And right at the very bottom end, helping young writers, young performers, uh, new emerging performers, uh, you know, with workshops and uh, 
all, all kinds of things. I went on a lovely red residency with them and everything, and their office is just down there. And if we're lucky, it's it's about time for them to be starting work, so we might run into them as we go. But oh, yeah. we're going to go that way now. You can also see the cathedral that we've just come from. Oh, yeah, you can see the cathedral we've just come from. You can see the cathedral from everywhere because Norwich is very flat, except for the hill we just walked up. <laughs> uh, so we're going past, and I, I mentioned... I mentioned the amount of churches in, in Norwich, uh, and we're going to come past, uh, it's actually not a church, it's a monastery, um, but a wonderful building called uh, St Andrew's Hall, which used to be, uh, as I say, um, a Blackfriars, uh, what they call Dominican monastery. Um, and in most other cities you go to in this, uh, in this country, you'll find the old stuff during the dissolution got torn down. All the churches fell out of use, they got torn down, got built over with horrible new... Um, uh, modern buildings and so on and so forth. But in Norwich, we've always had this feeling that we, we, we like our old buildings and we would like to keep hold of them because they're, they're still useful. And as we go around, you'll find that there are, there are 33 odd churches still standing in Norwich. If I can turn around, so you can see St Andrews behind me. Um, there are 33 churches remaining in Norwich, but most of them aren't churches. They've been turned into little art spaces galleries, art centres and things like that and uh, again more places where you can find to go out and perform and there's a lovely bin, <laughs> bin lorry um, hey. which is uh, a bit noisy so let's carry on moving. So where are we going next Tom? Oh, uh, yeah that's an Andrew's passage yeah. More churches, even the cinemas in a lovely old building. I think that was like a cattle market, wasn't it, the cinema? No idea. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, okay, so, uh, other people I uh, could talk about while, they, while we're going, there's another church. Other people I could talk about, um, I wrote them all on my hand so I won't forget them. Oh, um, yeah, Nor Norwich is, although it's a very small city and we're walking across it uh, in 20 minutes, um, there, there are a lot of places we could go and places we could talk about. There are going to be a few that I, I couldn't really get far out enough uh, to actually talk about. Um, but next on my list is uh, Amelia Opie, um, or Opie, uh, which is Opie Street. is just up there, but we're not going that way. Um, and she was, uh, again, an incredibly uh, prolific writer. Um, and uh, again, in a time where it wasn't really, there weren't, certainly many women who made their living by being a writer uh, and so on and so forth. So she um, lived round here, just up that way. Uh, just going to squeeze our way past these lovely vans. I have to do a bit of single file here so you can enjoy the back of Andy's head. Okay, other Norwich writers don't think of. Um, George Borrow. Uh, is another good one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just, a, just to give an idea of the history of Norwich um, in, in a, from a literary perspective, but also hopefully giving you some ideas um, of, of people you could go and works you could look up. Um, George Borrow's two great works really are uh, uh, Romany Rye and Lavengro. And um, both worth a read and, and both uh, have a lot of action happening in Norwich. Um, but at these first <laughs> There's a nice interesting story that his first um, book was a translation of Faust and when he described hell, he changed one word from a German city uh, to the name of Norwich and, and described basically Norwich as a part of hell. And so in celebration, uh, the sort of per first public subscription library in Norwich uh, ceremonially had copies of his first publication burnt, um, <laughs> but we've kind of forgiven him now I think. And, there's roads named after him and things like that. Um, so he's another one uh, to go and look up. Where are we headed to now? Okay, yeah, the, where we're headed to now is um, the Madder Market Theatre um, and the Madder Market Church. Um, and uh, there are very many characters uh, to, to um, look up about that. One is uh, Nugent Monk, who was uh, the, the guy who actually ran the, the Madder Market as a theatre. Um, very eccentric in the Victorian period, and there's all kinds of legends of ghosts and things, which, believe it or not. Um, but there's also uh, one of, because we mentioned Shakespeare, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, uh, a guy called Will Kemp. Um, he uh, 
he had a bit of a falling out with the Chamberlain's men, and his career did a, a little bit take a bit of a nosedive uh, after he split up and fell out with Shakespeare. Um, but what a thing that was very common uh, in the Tudor period was to, to take stupid, stupid bets. Um, and we basically did this thing uh, where he took a bet where he was just going to cross another road. He had to, he had to uh, Morris dance from London to Norwich in nine days, um, which is 215 miles, something like that, and he had to Morris dance all the way. I'm not going to do an attempt to show you what a Morris dance is. If you don't know, please, YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, so he did this. Now it sounds like he called it the Nine Days Wonder. He published a, uh, a whole book about it, trying to make a bit more money and everything like that. It sounds like he did it on like a Monday and was dancing till like the next Wednesday. No, it took him like three months, nine separate days over three months. But um, when he arrived in Norwich, there was a lot of publicity about it. Uh, when he arrived in Norwich, the crowd, the press of people, was so much in this street, Dub Street as it is now, um, that he couldn't actually get through the cloud, crowd to finish his bet. So what he was forced to do was jump over this wall here um, into the churchyard of St John Manor Market, which is the church here, um, and then kind of sneak his way to the mayor's house and thereby win his bet. Um, but because after word of that got out, um, basically people said, well, you jumped over the fence, you didn't Morris dance over the fence, did you? Um, so that a lot of people were unwilling to pay him uh, what he what he owed them, what they owed him. So there's the wall there. Go down and see it, and he doesn't have to walk all the way down the hill and up the hill again. There's a wall. There's the graveyard. Yeah, there you go, you've got it. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, come on, we're running out of time, we're running out of time. Uh, okay, who else, who else can we talk about? Uh, we'll talk about uh, Harriet Martineau, um, uh, abolitionist, and, and many people consider the mother of so modern sociology. Um, she lived and worked around here as well. Um, and again, in a time where it wasn't really a fitting woman's place and a woman thing to do. Um, and many of you um, will, I imagine, be aware of uh, the most famous work of Anna Selby. Uh, Anna Selby, no, Anna Sewell. Anna Selby used to work, <laughs> work with me. Oh, yeah, I know her. Yeah, we know Anna Selby. Different thing. Anyway, uh, Anna Sewell, who wrote Black Beauty. Um, obviously, a wonderful children's favourite. Um, everyone knows the movie. Everything like that. But the sad story about Anna is that um, she sold the rights, to the copyrights to uh, Black Beauty to Gerald the Printer for about £20. Still quite a lot in, that, uh, in those days. Um, but obviously... It got translated into like 16 odd languages and made millions for them. Um, but she got nothing. Which is very sad. Now we're coming up to a bit where my breath completely gives up. Um, and we're coming up to a, a nice little pub called Birdcage. And I said I was going to talk about kind of live lit scene here. But this is certainly uh, the place where I cut my teeth as a performer and um, many others. And if you go around uh, the sort of live lit scene, if you call it that. Um, you'll find a lot of people, um, names spring to mind, Luke Wright, John Osborne, Tim Claire, Molly Naylor, all of whom will have cut their teeth uh, doing performances in there. Um, and it's a lovely place. And they still, they still do, uh, you know, every Wednesday or Thursday, every Wednesday or Thursday, there'll be some sort of event. It's, it's a couple of quid. You can go down there and check it out. Um, and it's the kind of thing, again, you can just try out new material, try out new stuff, try out new things, um, and you know nobody judges you for it. In fact, they're the most wonderful audience I've played to. Um, yeah, even I've been on there, so it must be pretty. Uh, yeah, we even booked on a couple <laughs> of times, so that's great. Must be pretty accepting. Oh, it's pretty though, isn't it? Right, very quickly, we're getting towards the end of our talk, um, but uh, we've got a bit, a bit more of a walk. I'm talking about and some of the names I just mentioned as well. Um, the other great thing uh, about Norwich, I suppose, is that that way, far too far for us to walk to, is the University of East Anglia, or UEA, um, where in, I think, 1971, somewhere about there, um, a guy called Mark Luckham Bradbury started the first creative writing masters of the arts program here. Um, and it's in, the, in, in that time, what we're talking about, 50 years, 40 years, um, it's gone... It's world-renowned for producing um, just the 
most amazing authors, um, Kashiro Ishiguro, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Ian McEwen, uh, people like that. Um, and a lot of the, the people I just mentioned, um, or they, cause they do a poetry MA, they do a uh, fiction MA, and so on and so forth. Um, and, but as well as you know, producing these amazing, famous writers who went on to have great careers, this also means that every year there's an influx of new writers coming into Norwich and coming to places like the Birdcage and performing their stuff. Um, and a lot of them, Norwich has the highest retention rate for graduates in the country. So a lot of them stay here. So we have, because of that course, because of that university, a really high proportion of young, energetic writers coming in and staying here and joining the literary scene, as it were. Um, and it, it just basically gives it fresh input, impetus, fresh blood every year. Tom might have to walk backwards a little bit because of the yeah, sun. Yeah, because of the sun. It's going crazy. Um, one last thing I want to mention. Now, we're not going to get time to actually go and see his statue, but just around the corner from where I am, there's a statue of a guy called Sir Thomas Brown. Um, again, he's not really that well known these days. Watch out for the bike uh, racks. Thing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, he's not really that well known these days, but uh, for his time, he was an amazing, he was a doctor, basically, but he's also important for the literary history because he wrote some amazing things. Um, one called, in Latin, I'm not going to tell the Latin, but translated, The Religion of Doctors, um, which is a very unorthodox piece about, you know, science and versus religion and so on and so forth. Um, he may have gotten a little bit of trouble with that. But his world-renowned doctrine, his, um, one of his most famous works is called Urn Burial. Um, and uh, that's, that's, that's got, got nothing really to do with medicine. It's him sort of uh, discoursing philosophically on, uh, on the practice of urn burial in uh, Anglo-Saxon cemetery that have been discovered. Um, and he's like, if you think about the people we have uh, statues of in Norwich, Nelson, obviously, Wellington, obviously, and then Sir Thomas Brown. And nobody's heard of him. Why has he got a statue? But actually, when you look into it, he's an incredibly famous and influential person uh, during the sort of interregnum and restoration periods. Now, one little pause, Car. because there's cars coming both ways. Hello. I don't like it when you wave at them sometimes. Okay, now, we're going to finish our tour just at the top of these steps, because... We started at the cathedral. Oh, uh, let's not bother with the map. Oh, we started at the cathedral, and I, I mentioned that the Singer's collection of books was really one of the first libraries ever bequeathed to Norwich. Well, now we've got not necessarily the biggest library in the country, but definitely the busiest library in the country, and that is this: uh, the Norwich Millennium Library, um, which was opened about ten years ago to replace the one that tragically burned down. But it is the busiest by footfall in the country. And any writer, especially any poor writer like myself, has to have some something, a resource like this. Um, because somebody suggests something, any of the books I just suggested, you can come here and they will, if they haven't got it, they will order it for you. Um, and it's just a, a brilliant place for people to hang out and meet and, and things like that. Um, I'm pretty much run out of things to say now. I'm going to sign off. I'd like to thank, obviously, all the guys down in Melbourne uh, for the Digital Writers Festival. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, even if I didn't get into the performing arts to get up this early in the morning. I'd like to thank Tom for being my wonderful cameraman. Thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, if you want to follow any of my stuff, um, Andy Bennett Poet, uh, at Andy Bennett Poet on Twitter, and andybennettpoet.co.uk is my website. Um, this has been an absolute blast. Uh, see you later. Thank you very much.